Hello, and welcome to tonight's edition of Interactive Stargazing. My name is Ariel Daniel, and I'm a educator uh, here at the Lowell Observatory. Uh, tonight, we will be using our 14-inch plane wave telescope to uh, show you guys some really cool objects in the sky. Um, I also want to mention real quick that on the 21st will be the Great Conjunction, where Jupiter and Saturn will be very close in the sky. Uh, right now in Arizona, it's about 8 p.m., so they are set below our horizon. We can't quite grab them um, uh, tonight, but we will be able to grab them on the 21st. Um, so please, uh, you know, stay tuned for that if you would like to uh, see that on the 21st. Um, so first off, what we have here on our screen is the Bowtie Nebula. Uh, this is a planetary nebula about 3,500 light years away. It's also known as NGC 40. Uh, what this means or what a planetary nebula is, uh, it's, is it is a dying star or a dying sun-like star. Um, this So the death of an average star, I suppose. Um, our sun is an incredibly average star. Um, so this hypothetically could be what our sun will look like in about 5 billion years. Uh, what we have going on here is that red gas is uh, elements and gas that have been created throughout that star's lifetime. And right in the center, that brighter star is a white dwarf. That is the dying core of the star um, that's being um, and that, that dying core of the star is expelling out all of those gases and elements that that star has created throughout its lifetime. Um, I see a request from Stephen Border uh, to look at the Orion Nebula, and I believe that we can grab that right now. Uh, the Orion Nebula is one of my favorite objects to look at, um, one of the coolest things in the sky in my opinion. Uh, the Orion Nebula is a star forming region in the constellation of Orion. Um, if we could actually, we can use this, um, the software that we're using is called Malincam Sky. Uh, we can pull up that screen again and see exactly where the Orion Nebula is in the sky. Um, it is the uh, in the sort of Orion. So we can see Orion's belt, you know, the asterism, the Orion belt, and just beneath the belt, uh, we can see uh, the sword. There are kind of it's like a mini belt. There are three stars in the sword, or what look like three stars in the sword. The middle star in the sword is the entire Orion Nebula. Now you'll notice it looks kind of fuzzy and weird right now. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of the screen there, it says exposure. Uh, we are taking a 15 second long exposure of this object right now. Um, that looks awesome. That looks beautiful. Oh my goodness. Uh, as we were moving the telescope to look at this object, we continue taking an exposure and that's why we saw like, a, oh, is there a satellite coming through right there? Ooh, I think so. We might be able to see a satellite. Yeah, we just saw a satellite go through that, that little, that little stripe at the bottom or that little stripe at the top there. Um, but uh, the Orion Nebula, again, is a star forming region in the constellation Orion, uh, also known as M42. Uh, what we're seeing here again is, or is gas, that, that red uh, cloud, also that like darker cloud is uh, primarily hydrogen gas that's helping form these uh, really bright baby stars. Um, what we could do is we could actually lower, I think, the exposure a little bit or lower the gain a little bit, and we can see these four stars in the center of uh, the Orion Nebula called the trapezium. Nice, I love that. Um, if we lower it a little bit more, nice, yeah. So right in the center, you know, all that stuff is really blown out with all of the, that star forming and all of that stellar light in the center. Uh, but right there, we can see um, the, what's called the trapezium. Um, that's very, it's easily visible with, um, uh, with when you're looking at the Orion Nebula through a telescope, um, but we we get a, a really nice view as well with a longer exposure um, through our Malincam software. So when we uh, up the exposure a little more, uh, we saw that that red gas and what looks like a, a darker cloud, um, <clears throat> that's a dark nebula. So that cloud in the front is just more gas that's helping form those, those baby stars. Um, so it'll look like the, the nebula is kind of being like backlit almost. Um, but uh, yeah, we can see there's a very large area of the sky that's kind of um, covering this, um, uh, this, this nebula takes up a, a, what looks like a large area of the sky. There's, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of baby stars being born there. Now, 
Let's see. I see there is a qu request for the Horsehead Nebula. Uh, we can grab him in just a minute. He is still rising. Maybe in like another object or two, we can try. Uh, we can try grabbing him. Uh, that also looks fantastic. Uh, before that, uh, beautiful. Ah, oh, I love Orion. So cute. So cute. Uh, before that, let's jump over to uh, the Bubble Nebula. So. We're looking at you know these stellar births in a in a in a uh, nebula like the Orion Nebula to stellar deaths in something like a planetary nebula. So the uh, term or the word the name planetary nebula is a bit misleading because there's no real planets involved. It's just when we were first discovering these objects, um, older astronomers they saw this big white dot in the center and they thought, oh okay, that kind of looks like Jupiter. So we're going to say it's a planet and it's covered in all this gas or there's all this gas around it. So we're going to call it a nebula. So planetary nebula stuck. Um, that planet in the center is not some kind of Jupiter-esque thing. Uh, what it is is the dying core of the star, as I mentioned previously, like with the uh, with the Bowtie Nebula. Now. Uh, the Bubble Nebula is also known as NGC 7635, and it's about 11,000 light years away. So we can see that red gas there, um, part of the nebula, and then that uh, brighter dot in the center is um, the uh, white dwarf in uh, the Bubble Nebula. So these nebulas come in all different shapes and sizes, uh, especially you know planetary nebulas and star forming regions. Um, I see we have a request for the Crab Nebula. Now, I believe we can go and jump on over to that. Uh, Crab Nebula is, the Crab Nebula is also known as M1. It is a supernova remnant. Uh, what that means is, uh, <clears throat> um, it is the death of a very large star. We're actually gonna up the exposure for the Bubble Nebula real quick to get you guys a really good view. Um, of exactly what's going on here, because uh, right now we can only see a little bit of that uh, that gas that's being expelled out of the planetary. And now that looks neat. I love that. Um, we can see a lot more gas um, uh, around that white dwarf, um, <clears throat> all of that red gas surrounding it. Um, so. Okay, cool. Could we try for the uh, for M1 real fast? Um, yeah, so M1 or the Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant, so uh, the death of a very massive star. So we're looking at planetary nebulas, which are deaths of lower mass or average mass stars. Basically, like the bigger the star, the bigger the death kind of kind of a thing. Um, so this uh, supernova or this star exploded. Uh, I believe back in like the 1300s, 1400s, and uh, older astronomers actually, like, you know, wrote about it. And there was this giant uh, light in the sky, uh, you know, nearly the, the size of a full moon, or nearly the brightness of a full moon. Um, and uh, we can still see this supernova remnant today. So uh, I believe the next star in our night sky set to go supernova is actually Betelgeuse. Um, I can't say it anymore. I'll get in trouble. <laughs> but uh uh, that star, it's a red supergiant star, so a very, very massive star. So the same kind of star that died um, creating this crab nebula. Um, <clears throat> Betelgeuse is about the size of Jupiter's orbit. So if Betelgeuse were to be, oh no, I said it three times. If Betelgeuse were to be in the center of our uh, solar system, it would engulf every planet up to Jupiter. So a giant star. Uh, as for when it's set to explode, like tonight, tomorrow, or in 10,000 years, we're not totally sure. So. I'll keep you posted on that. But uh, with something like a supernova, uh, like the Crab Nebula here, we don't get lighter elements like how we do with planetary nebulas. We get heavier elements and metals. So like if you have a gold ring, that gold was formed from within a supernova. And the universe is just one big old recycling bin. Now, um, let's go and try for uh, Mars. So Mars is up in the sky. Uh, Mars is real neat. Uh, Mars is actually the reason why this observatory was founded uh, back in 1894. Percival Lowell, the founder of the observatory, um, he wanted to map and study Mars because he thought he was seeing these canals on its surface, these kind of stripes 
on its surface. You'll notice we're going to be lowering the exposure time instead of seconds of exposure. We're going to be using milliseconds of exposure uh, because Mars is very bright or Mars is a lot closer and a lot brighter than these uh, deep sky objects. Uh, so he'll be this little orange guy. He is visible in the sky with your naked eye as well. Um, and maybe if we uh, down the exposure a little bit, we're able to see that Maria on Mars's surface. So we see that that um, general orange surface. The reason why the um, Mars is kind of like moving around or looks like it's like shaking in the eyepiece is because of atmospheric turbulence. So wind in the upper atmosphere or just the fact that we're looking through a lot of atmosphere to look at him. Um, so you might see some darker smudges kind of on that um, that northern um, portion of Mars, and that is evidence of ancient volcanic eruptions. Um, so Percival Lowell, yeah, he thought he was seeing these canals on Mars, these, these man-made almost structures or Martian-made structures. And that was like common knowledge within the scientific community up until the 60s. Like we all thought that there was life on Mars, and it wasn't until the Mariner missions um, in the, in the sixties where we were able to fly past Mars and actually get, you know, up close and personal images of the surface. Uh, and we found out that there are no canals in there. Uh, as of right now, there are no, you know, little green men hanging out on Mars. Uh, what we think happened is Percival Lowell was just straining so hard that he was like seeing the veins in his eyeballs, like the backs of his eyeballs. So sad, but still neat. <laughs> a lot of people associate Lowell with Pluto, but uh, Mars is actually the reason why we are here. Now, uh, is the horse head up or is it still just a little too low? Um, if it's still a little too low, we could try the um, flame nebula. <clears throat> So we're looking for the uh, name or the, the like scientific name of the Horsehead Nebula right now. And now we're going to go ahead and up our exposure because, you know, with Mars, again, we we're just using a couple milliseconds, but we're going to jump on back over to a couple actual seconds. Uh, the Horsehead Nebula, I believe, is in the constellation Orion. It is another star forming region. Um, and the dark nebula, so like the gas that's kind of um, in front of the, the stars being born, it, again, the, those that, uh, the dark nebula is kind of backlit. Uh, and if you squint, you can kind of make it out to look like a horse head. Now, I think we're going to uh, mess with our exposure um, a little bit more, but the uh, entire constellation of Orion has a bunch of really cool um, deep sky objects in it, a bunch of really cool star forming regions and, and nebulae and that kind of thing. Um, so just barely we're able to see some of that uh, red gas, which I believe is primarily hydrogen gas. The universe is like 90% hydrogen. <laughs> that stuff makes up everything. Uh, we adjusted our settings and upped our exposure a little bit more to try to um, make out that actual horse head. And he should be appearing right in the center. Um, just about. Yeah, he's like upside down right now. <laughs> so he's hanging out right there. Uh, we can see that gas in the center there. that's kind of being uh, backlit by that uh, red hydrogen gas that's being lit up by the stars kind of in the middle of that nebula. Because, you know, space is a 3D thing. So we've got stars in the center and gas on either side. So the uh, hydrogen gas in front of those stars is what's making... Um, that, uh, that horse head shape. Um, we could go ahead and try for um, Running Man, the Running Man Nebula. So this is another um, star forming region and uh, another, another object where you kind of have to use your like your imagination. <laughs> Uh, if you squint and kind of tilt your head, uh, it looks like a little dude, like a little guy running <laughs> in the sky. Uh, you'll see uh, more blue gas than uh, red gas because it is a reflecting or a, or a reflective nebula. Um, so we moved the telescope and we're upping the exposure again. So these nebulae have enough mass and gas to form tens of thousands of sun-like stars. Nice. He looks real good. Yeah, so he kind of looks like he's straining to run the uh, 
weirdly positioned kind of going, going up. But um, the, uh, I see a question, what size and type of telescope are we using? We are using a 14 inch um, plane wave, reflecting plane wave telescope. And we are using Malincam software and a Malin camera to uh, get all of these images for you guys. So uh, the Running Man Nebula is another uh, star forming region uh, coming up in the sky right now. You can, you can kind of see uh, the star at the bottom or the brighter star kind of within the nebula um, that's covered in that gas. Um, so we can see um, the gas being kind of backlit and translucent by these really bright baby protostars, these really hot bright blue stars. Um, I see a question, is Jupiter uh, visible, ready for the conjunction. So Jupiter is set below our horizon, are uh, in Flagstaff right now. Uh, we can't see him in the sky tonight. Um, as the sun is setting, we're able to see him in Flagstaff, um, and we will be hosting a live stream on the 21st to see the conjunction um, during its peak. So if you would like to see it then, uh, feel free to come back and check us out there. Um, why uh, I see a question from Daniel, why is the Running Man Nebula called so? A lot of these things in the sky are, you know, like the Owl Nebula, the Running Man Nebula, the Flame Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula. They're named these things because they vaguely look like the object <laughs> that they're named after. Uh, so the Running Man Nebula is called the Running Man uh, because that kind of gap in the gas or, uh, looks sort of like a man straining <laughs> to run. So again, it kind of looks like he's, uh, he's running like straight up almost like where those three stars are is the floor and, and, uh, forward is kind of like that upper portion of the screen. So yeah, he kind of looks like he's, he's running straight up. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, could we possibly try the flame nebula? Uh, the Flame Nebula is another star-forming region. Um, <clears throat> he is uh, the dark nebula, or either absence of gas or gas that's covering up the um, light source or covering up those stars that are lighting up the gas. Uh, sort of looks like a little, a little flame, or a, yeah, a little, a little fire, or it's shaped like a little fire. It doesn't really look like it's on fire. But uh, the Flame Nebula is another really cool star forming region uh, that I like to look at. We'll also kind of see like what looks like different colors. Um, so, you know, we have like reflecting nebulas, uh, we have emission nebulas and dark nebulas. And um, the Horsehead Nebula, we kind of saw the dark nebula where that gas was, was uh, not really, not super bright. Uh, the, uh, the flame nebula here, uh, the flames kind of go in sideways, you know, the flame like starts to the left and goes off to the right. Um, so we can see there's that, uh, this darker portion in the front, which is that gas that's covering up that starlight. And then there's gas in the back that's being illuminated um, by this starlight. So we're seeing what kind of looks like a little fire or a little flame in the sky. I like this guy. Um, so let's try, uh, would it be possible to grab a galaxy? Could we possibly do NGC 891? <clears throat> now NGC 891 is an edge on unbarred spiral galaxy. Um, what that means is galaxies are, I think of galaxies like little fried eggs where, you know, you, you have the, the white of the egg and then the yolk of the egg. And the yolk is kind of like the center of the galaxy and the white of the egg could be the spiral arms or like the rest of the body of the galaxy. Um, now <clears throat> edge on means instead of the egg facing you or instead of the galaxy facing you, it's sort of like this. So we see the edge of the galaxy. So, um, Looking at uh, this galaxy, which is about 30 million light years away, um, in the center, we can see where the galaxy center would be. We can see like more light coming out of that center there. So that's where that supermassive black hole is that's holding together that galaxy. And all of these, uh, all of this gas and all of these star forming regions are orbiting about that center um, of mass there. So we see this kind of darker stripe going through uh, that edge there. And that is where those, um, 
those spiral arms are. But since, you know, we're, again, we're looking edge on, we can't see those individual spirals. It just sort of looks like um, a straight line. Um, uh, it's also in the constellation Andromeda. I like this guy. Uh, I see a request to look at the Helix Nebula. Now, Helix is up, it's a little faint, and uh, it is large in the sky, but we can definitely go and try to grab him. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we actually like have too close of a view <laughs> uh, to see the entirety of the Helix Nebula. Um, but uh, another nebula, so I believe the Helix Nebula is a planetary. So, you know, planetaries, again, come in all different shapes and sizes. Nebulas in general, these, these big clouds of gas come, come in all different um, colors and, and shapes and, and that kind of thing. But yeah, so <laughs> yeah, I think the Helix Nebula is like a really popular image, um, a popular Hubble image. Um, but here we can see um, we're taking another exposure because we we're taking the exposure as we were moving the telescope. So we'll see kind of like those stars looking like they're they're moving in the in the view. But in the center, we can see um, that kind of blue teal gas and the white dwarf like right in the center of the view. And then we can see uh, what looks sort of like that yellow and red gas uh, coming around the edges there. So uh, very large <laughs> in our in our view here, uh, but this is another example of a planetary nebula. Um, I see a question from Jasmine: the nearest constellation map, uh, they are the nearest constellation to spot more Geminids meteor shower. So uh, the Geminids, I believe, peaked yesterday. Uh, you might be able to see some stray, uh, some stray meteors uh, in the constellation coming from the constellation Gemini. So um, it'll be sort of towards the eastern horizon, or if you face towards the eastern horizon uh, later in the night, kind of around like after nine, um, that is where the Geminids meteors um, originate from, the constellation Gemini. Uh, but again, it peaked uh, yesterday or two days ago, so um, it won't be as bright or as many meteors as. Um, uh, the, the peak of the shower, but you may still be able to get some, some stray meteors or shooting stars. Um, I see a request from Tom Sarko for NGC 253. So NGC 253 is the Sculptor Galaxy. Uh, this is a spiral galaxy in the constellation Sculptor. <laughs> Very original name. <laughs> Um, now, the Sculptor Galaxy is really neat because it's a starburst galaxy, um, meaning there is a lot of star forming happening here. So it's a very young galaxy and a very active uh, galaxy that's about 11 million light years away. Um, now, if you guys want to get in any, uh, you know, last requests in uh, before, you know, we're going to try to... Uh, and this around 8.30 because my telescope operators are outside and they're very cold. Um, so yeah, the Sculptor Galaxy is a beautiful view. We can um, kind of, instead of edge on, we can see the actual uh, center of that galaxy. Uh, so we see, you know, the, the core of the galaxy, uh, all of that light, and then we can start seeing what look like those little, those little spirals coming out. And that's where um, all of those star forming regions are, like things like um, our Orion Nebula. Um, so, the Orion Nebula is in our own galaxy, but you know there are uh, star forming regions and all these other spiral galaxies as well. But what we see in our galaxy is also happening in other uh, spiral galaxies like ours. Um, <clears throat> we could try for, um, ooh, is the Andromeda Galaxy? Can we, is that one okay, M31? So um, Andromeda is a lot closer to us than the Sculptor Galaxy is. Uh, the Andromeda Galaxy is um, only two and a half million light years away, and the Sculptor Galaxy is about 11 million light years away. But, uh, ooh, Andromeda is actually too low. My apologies. <laughs> um, oh, no, wait, Eskimo Nebula. So the Eskimo Nebula in the constellation Gemini is too low. Um, it will be visible um, in a couple or like in like a month or so. It should be uh, uh, like a little higher up in the sky around this time of night. Um, the Andromeda galaxy, we are able to see though, uh, she is still in the sky. So we can see that that galaxy center is so <laughs> bright uh, because it's so much closer to us 
uh, you know, only two and a half million light years away, but, um, you know, like something like the Sculptor Galaxy, that was 11 million light years away. So we are looking super close uh, into Andromeda. Um, so the actual galaxy takes up, you know, like a couple of screens worth um, on either on either end. Um, but here we're able to see again that galaxy center and then those uh, darker sort of strips are those um, spiral um, arms of Andromeda. And we can see, uh, you know, the, those, uh, those kind of uh, oh my gosh, spirals are where that uh, star forming is occurring. Uh, Andromeda is actually like heading towards us at like, uh, <laughs> what, like 70 or 80 miles a second. And it will collide with us in uh, about like 4 billion years, uh, collide with us to create either Milk Andromeda or Andromeda Way. Um, now, yeah, Eskimo Nebula is too low. Uh, the moon is not up. It's also nearly a new moon. Uh, the moon set earlier uh, in the day. I'm up, I apologize, we can't quite grab him yet. Um, M27 is the Dumbbell Nebula and he is too low to grab. I apologize, he has set already. Um, but we can see Uranus. <clears throat> so uh, Uranus and Neptune are both in the sky right now. Uh, Uranus and Neptune are our ice giants. So they are a type of gas giant, but like a subsection called ice giant because of the um, ammonia ices. Um, I believe we are able to see the moon, some of the moons of Uranus. So those uh, little white dots uh, to the upper right and lower left of Uranus are some of its moons. Um, I like the story behind Uranus's moons because all of the moons in our, um, our solar system are named after like characters in Greek and Roman mythology. Uh, but the moons of Uranus are actually named after characters from like Shakespearean novels. So we've got moons named some like Oberon or Ariel. Um, so I think that's neat. Uh, Uranus is also, <clears throat> uh, because of Uranus and Neptune's carbon content, uh, we believe that there are certain areas in, or some astronomers believe that there are certain areas in these planets where there are oceans of liquid diamond and diamond bergs and it rains diamond. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, we could jump over to Neptune to try to see some, some blue difference um, in these two. Um, but Uranus and Neptune, um, I believe Uranus actually is the windiest area in our solar system with winds naturally approaching supersonic speeds, like over 1200 miles an hour. So it rains diamonds, but it would blow the skin off of your body. So like, you know, you gotta, you gotta pick one, but, uh, <laughs> Uranus and Neptune are both these really pretty, uh, bluish tealish colors. I think Neptune looks a little more teal. Um, and I think we can see Triton just to the left of Neptune. Uh, we're able to see Triton. Um, nice. Yeah. So it is Triton. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I, Uranus and Neptune are really neat because, uh, if you like look up like a high definition image of these planets, uh, the most recent high definition image or our most recent flyby of these planets was the, from the Voyager missions back in the eighties. So that was like technology from the 60s, launched in the 70s. We flew by and got images in the 80s, and we haven't had a flyby since. So they've been really lonely. They've been really lonely these past couple decades. Uh, and the Voyager missions are, are still going. Uh, I think Voyager 2 was like, we last kind of activated its, its thrusters in 2017, uh, which is like blows my mind every time I think about it. Again, like technology from the 60s that's still hanging out there, passes the heliosphere, and um, where uh, we can still like tell him what to do and he can still talk to us. And I think, I think that's really neat. Well, um, I believe we are just about out of um, uh, requests to look at. Um, thank you guys so much for hanging out on this or tonight's edition of Interactive Stargazing. Um, again, if you guys would like to view our live stream um, uh, about the a uh, great conjunction happening on the 21st. Feel free to check out um, our channel again. I believe it is. it starts at 5 p.m. on the 21st. We'll have some really nice views of um, Jupiter and Saturn and a lot of really smart people talking about really cool stuff and, and um, all the cool science and what exactly a conjunction is and, and um, neat facts about uh, 
Jupiter and Saturn. So uh, with that, thank you guys so much for uh, hanging out and we will see you next time.